All right. Okay. So I think we are ready to go. Let me see. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Everything's good. Good. Okay. Hello and welcome to today's video where we are going to be talking about why you still, still need to cope, numb, self-sabotage, scapegoat, engage in your behaviors, even though you're doing your self-love path, okay? So we know that in this work and if you're in the mystery school, we talk so much about how our coping mechanisms, our self-sabotage, our numbing, our scapegoating, the ways that we hurt ourselves and we hurt others are rooted in unmet need, right? In, in not understanding ourselves, not understanding what we want, not understanding what we need, um, and not understanding how reality works. So they're rooted in a kind of pain. We're in pain in some, some way, or we're trying to avoid pain in some way. We're trying to procure pleasure. And the way we're going about it has some negative impacts some coping, numbing, self-sabotage, it's that there's some positive intention and then there's some misunderstanding in us about ourselves or about reality and there's some programming, there's some information that we're not aware of that's leading us to continue to do these things that on their surface, on the surface, seem bad or seem harmful or lead to negative consequences, feel good in the moment and then feel bad later and we don't know why we're doing them and we don't know how to stop and we want to stop, right? And then, so a lot of us get into our self-love, our self-improvement, our personal growth work because we want to fix these things about ourselves, yes? We, we're coming to self-help, we're coming to self-improvement because we have anxiety and depression or physical pain and, and we are using tools like TV or drugs or alcohol or sex or whatever to numb the pain of these things and we want to stop that. We think that's the bad behavior. Or we're trying to live our normal lives, we're trying to work our jobs, we're trying to have our relationships, we're trying to do whatever it is that we think we're supposed to be doing, we're trying to live an adult life and we find ourselves continually coping, numbing, self-sabotaging, checking out, doing things that are seemingly, like I said, feel good in the moment but feel bad later and they, then we can't stop ourselves and we don't know why or we think we're doing what we're supposed to be doing and then we end up having to numb or stimulate or can't feel or whatever we feel hopeless in our lives okay and like i said you're on this path you're kind of understanding like okay so there's some sort of need under here there's right i'm not i'm not really addicted, I'm not really coping, I'm not really self-sabotaging, there's needs under this, there's information here, there's something I'm not aware of about myself. And you may be getting to the point where you're starting to discover what it is you need. Because remember, right, like, we are pretty advanced in this self-love uh, talk that we're doing, right? Most of the world still believes you're addicted to alcohol, you're addicted to food, you have an eating disorder, you keep picking the wrong partner, you don't know how to hold down a job, whatever. That's the thing we have to fix about you. And, and the self-improvement and the self-help and the spirituality world have a million different things to sell you to fix these broken parts about you, right? The, the mindset programs, the stimulate your nervous system programs, the uh, manifest abundance programs, the figure out what your true purpose and true calling is so that you can stop being addicted and blah, blah, blah. And most of the world is still operating under the assumption that humans are just doing negative things Right, it, like if you really boil it down, it's like because we're just not trying hard enough or we're not being positive enough or we're not having the right mindset or we're just choosing to self-sabotage, we're just choosing to scapegoat, we're just choosing to numb out because we're weak-willed or we're just, they, maybe they don't even really offer a solution, right? Like it's just your broken brain, it's just your broken body, it's just your broken way of being and, it, and you just need to stop that now. Right? And here's your tool for how to do it. 
So we're already way past that when we're sitting here saying, okay, well, but what's the reason? Like, why am I actually doing this? And not coming from a place of what's the reason why am I doing this? Like, what's wrong with me? Right? Because that's still where pretty much 99.99% of healing, health, wellness world is coming from. Is that like, we're going to figure out what's wrong with you so we can fix it. And we're being, we're coming from a totally different angle of like, what if this isn't something that's wrong with me? What if this is an adaptive strategy? What if this is how I'm currently meeting my needs that I don't know that I have? What if this comes from programming that I, I'm not aware that I have? What if these addictions, these coping mechanisms, these self-sabotage, these numbing things that I'm doing are because I don't actually like the life I'm living or I don't really want to be doing what I'm doing or I'm having to cope with this normal that isn't working for me? And all of these things that I've been conditioned to believe about myself and about the world, what if this stuff isn't true, right? Like, we're really advanced when we're even considering the things that we're considering here. So I just want to put that out there, right? Like, if you're even in the realm of not looking for what's wrong with you, like, if you're even sort of approaching that maybe there's not something wrong with you and you're broken and that's why you're doing these things, it, you're already like, wow, just take a step back and understand how far ahead of everyone else's thinking you already are, okay? I just want to say that, okay? Now, again, we may be doing this work and starting to get some answers, right? Being like, oh, I numb every single time I push myself beyond my actual capacities because I feel like that's what's expected of me. So I go too hard, I go too fast, and then I need to numb to make the pain of that go away. So this numbing behavior that I have isn't actually bad. It's how I'm coping with my belief that I need to work so hard and do all these things that comes from society. So maybe I need to learn how to take some breaks and you're learning to take some breaks. That was one of my first ones, okay? Maybe you're doing your work and you're realizing yet, like, yeah, I go on an alcohol bender every weekend or every week because the person that I have to be at my job and the person I have to be in my relationships and the person that I have to be so that everyone will like me isn't who I really am. I'm, I'm addicted to these substances because they're the only time I get to actually like let my real personality out or when I don't have to try so hard or when I can forget about these things. Right? I'm doing some self-introspection and I'm not just weak and addicted because I suck. It's, this is a tool that I'm using because I'm in pain being in my normal life. Right? You may be getting to that point. The other place that you might be is that you're sitting there and you're doing your coping, you're numbing, your self-sabotage, your scapegoat, whatever you're doing, and you're not getting any answers. You have no idea why you're doing it. You're asking yourself, what do I need? What's going on? Where's the pain? What's actually under this? And there's just nothing. There's no answer. You're not getting anything. And so if you're in either of these situations where you're continuing to engage in your behavior, even though you're figuring new things out and you're giving yourself, new, you're meeting your needs in new ways, you're doing new things, you're doing all this stuff, and you feel like you still need your thing, so what the heck? All the way to you're trying really hard to figure it out, and you literally have no idea, so you're still doing it. And you're sitting there and you're saying, what's wrong with me that I'm still doing this? What's wrong with me? What am I doing wrong? Or maybe this process doesn't work. Because shouldn't it be that if I figured out what I really need and I'm giving it to myself now that I can stop this? And shouldn't it be that if I'm doing this work and I'm asking these questions and I'm being a safe place for myself, that I should be getting these answers? And my answer to you is, it's actually way more complicated than that. You're not doing it wrong, but the process of actually figuring out what we need, and then the process of being able to give it to ourselves in a new way, and then that being something that our nervous systems and our bodies start to understand as the new default mechanism of what we fall back on when we're in pain, takes a really long time. So now we're going to zoom out, 
look at the whole picture again understand where all of these coping self-sabotaging scapegoat numbing behaviors came from so you can understand that it's way more complicated than just I I'm just gonna figure out what it is and do something new and that I should be able to do that new thing because it's better for me anyways okay so going back to the very beginning everything that you habitually do in your life if you take nothing from this video except for this please take this okay this is the most important part of this video every single thing that you do habitually in your life is a program that you have been building since probably before you were born nothing that you do on a habitual level is something that you came to in your adulthood and are just doing and can just stop nothing you're doing in a in a habitual way is something that started relatively recently in your life for no good reason that you can just alter in some way okay these core self-sabotage scapegoat numbing coping mechanisms that we all have you are going to be able to trace the roots of your behavior your current behavior so even if your current adult behavior is drinking alcohol or binging and purging or continually picking uh, unavailable people to be in relationships with or sabotaging yourself at work whatever so this very adult looking thing like that doesn't look like something you learned in your childhood right you're not gonna look back and be like yes I was an alcoholic at three years old you're gonna be like no like I didn't start doing that till I was in college I didn't start taking drugs till I was in my 20s this is a thing that developed in my adulthood that I should just be able to stop right I didn't start binging Netflix when I was five years old what are you talking about Aaliyah okay hold on yes everything that we have in our current adult reality that looks like an adult thing that developed in our adulthood has its roots has its foundations in our programming from our very, very, very first breaths on this planet. Okay? It is, it has all been being built upon a perceptual foundation that was given to you in your infancy that started to shape your view of the world. And these methods of coping, self-sabotaging, numbing, scapegoating are nervous system based programs. So not cognition based programs, nervous system based programs that have been evolving for your entire life using cognition to evolve them to the form that they're in now. But they did not start anywhere near the current time frame of your life okay the very first program all of us were handed was I'm in pain I'm in pleasure when I'm in pain I don't know why I'm in pain and I don't know how to fix it when I want pleasure I can't get that for myself survival and pleasure and pain are dependent upon these people outside of me understanding me and providing for me that was the first program we got survival comes from the outside that was before cognition that was before logic that was before reason that was before we had any physical capacity our nervous system programmed in survival getting my needs met comes from 
alerting the people around me to my pain or my pleasure, having them understand that and respond. That was the first program. The second program we got is when caregivers pull away. That is an existential threat. If for any reason these people decide they're going to abandon me, reject me, shame me, in any way threaten their position of provision in my life, I'm going to die. Okay. Understand. Those were your two, first two programs that got programmed into your nervous system before you had any cognition. Your body programmed those two things in as this is what reality is. My survival and my pain and my pleasure are fully dependent on the people around me. If they pull out, I die. Okay? That is the foundation upon which all of us have been building our worldview. Unless you've done some serious, hardcore inner child work. And most of us have not. Okay? That is where your fundamental perceptions of yourself and the world started to be developed. So your fundamental perception, like the way you view yourself, the opinions you hold of yourself and of others, were based on what is required of me by my caregivers to be accepted and not abandoned because that's what I need for my survival. Who do I have to be so that these people will continue to care for me? And when they don't, when they pull out, when they shame me, when they blame me, when they scold me, when they abandon me, when they rescue me when I'm in pain, my nervous system, your nervous system, registered that as an existential threat. I'm going to die. Because now I'm in pain, I'm young, I'm little, I don't know that this pain is just gas, I'm not going to die. I'm just hungry, I'm not going to die. I'm just scared, I fell down, I don't know how to get up, I'm, I don't know how to, I made a mess, I don't know how to fix it. All of these things that are just normal or whatever, right? So we, we look back on our childhood and we think, I didn't have trauma, everything was fine. From your child perspective, when you were in pain, and then you were abandoned, you were shamed, you were scolded, or you were rescued. To your child self, your nervous system that you actually had, it got programmed in that you were at risk of dying. This cannot be understated. That was a trauma. Because, yes, to our adult brain, you were fine. It was okay. Right? Mom didn't feed you for half an hour, you weren't going to die. You were crying because you fell down, and she just said, oh, honey, you're fine. But to your little nervous system, and especially depending upon how, how often and how much your caregivers rejected you, abandoned you, scolded you, shamed you, disapproved of you, like how often that was happening, is the degree to which your body started to learn, I'm not safe, I'm not safe, I'm not safe. Because again, that first fundamental program, I need these people for everything because I can't do it myself. Provision comes from the outside. If these people reject me, I'm gonna die, was there. And then you started to build on top of that, okay, what are the things that get me rejected? What are the things that get me abandoned? What are the things that get me approved of? 
What are the things that get it so that my caregivers give me what I need? And what are the things that make it so they take themselves away? And those started to become your programs, your perceptions for how life worked, for how you needed to be and what the answer was for pain and pleasure. So now remember, fast forward, coming into true adulthood, when we're no longer children physically, real reality speaks to us in pain and pleasure. Real pain means you're going against the structure of yourself and of reality. You're breaking yourself down. Real pleasure, which does not have a negative backlash, okay? So we all have consensus reality pleasure. The pleasure of going out and getting smashed with your friends and that's super fun because you feel accepted and you feel like you're part of the group and you're having fun and you don't have responsibilities, whatever. And then you wake up the next day and you have a hangover. That's consensus reality pleasure. The pleasure that makes us feel good in the moment and then hurts later. That's consensus reality pleasure. Then we have true pleasure, like really connecting with somebody and having a deep conversation. Or eating a nourishing meal that actually really does taste good and feel good in your body. Or going on a hike or creating something or resting when you're tired. The kind of pleasure that just feels good and that has no negative consequence. So now when we're looking at our coping, numbing, self-sabotaging, scapegoating behavior, these are all going to be consensus reality pleasure things. They're pleasure in the short term and then negative con consequences in the long term. And we think, what's wrong with me that I keep doing this? Well, from the very beginning of your life, you were learning what was and wasn't okay. How to get your needs met through changing and altering your behavior so that other people would respond to you in different ways. How you got your needs met in your childhood wasn't, what's my need? How do I interact with reality so that I can get that need met? In your childhood, getting your needs met was, what's my need? What do I need to do to signal to my caregivers what I need so that they will do it for me? Provision comes from the outside. So this is why I keep saying that love equals safety to our nervous systems. Because again, the first program we all got was provision comes from the outside. Love equals these people are going to provide for me. Love equals safety. And therefore, the opposite programming is also true for us. Provision and everything comes from the outside. If these people abandon me, if they reject me, if they don't understand me, if they don't meet my need, I don't get my need met, and I die. So again, this is where we all started to have these parts of ourselves that we started to reject. These parts of ourselves we started to put into the shadow. These parts of ourselves that didn't get to learn from our experiences, that made messes and got yelled at and we just learned to ad adapt our behavior, but we didn't learn why. We didn't understand the actual concept. We didn't actually learn. We just got scared and changed our behavior. You see, this is where all of these programs of self-sabotage and not knowing ourselves and not being connected to our own intuition and not knowing what is actually true or right for us, not having connection to true pain and true pleasure, which is reality speaking to us, we got wired that pleasure comes from being provided for and understood and loved by the outside. Because again, that was how we got our needs met in childhood. So it is true that ultimately we feel pleasure when we are getting our needs met. And ultimately we feel pain when we aren't. But where it's gotten confused is where our caregivers and society and the programs we were handed aren't actually in alignment with real reality. 
So what gets us approved of isn't actually truly good for us. What gets us rejected isn't actually truly bad for us. What actually meets our need gets us abandoned, gets us rejected, gets us misunderstood. What we would have needed to do to go through a learning process gets us abandoned, rejected, and misunderstood. So now we have our pain and pe pleasure wires crossed. Our true real selves would feel bad when we're not getting a certain need met. But if not getting that need met gets us approval, there's going to be a part of us that feels pleasure from that. So now we don't know if we're supposed to be following the consensus reality, I'm getting accepted, I'm getting loved, which to my nervous system is telling me I'm going to get my needs met and I'm going to be okay. You see that program that got built in our childhood? So now at, in adulthood, being accepted, being approved of, being loved feels good because that was that program. Being accepted equals getting my needs met equals surviving. But what happens when being approved of and what you have to do to be approved of actually goes against real reality and what is good for you? So now we have consensus reality, pain and pleasure. The kind of pleasure that feels good in the moment because it gets us accepted or it stops us from doing something that got us rejected. That self-sabotage. Right? We stop ourselves from doing something. Feels good in the moment. Feels bad overall because real reality continues to speak and says, but that's bad for you. And then the opposite is true. I'm doing something that's getting me rejected. It feels terrible in the moment. It feels like pain right now because it makes other people not like me or it confronts my conditioning of what is right and what is good, right? Because now we don't even need to be approved of or abandoned in real reality to feel like we're gonna die for doing something, right? It's so programmed into our nervous system that being this way gets me rejected, that you could be alone in your apartment. No one is there to see, no one is there to know. And you're like, okay, I'm going to try doing this thing that I know is authentic to me, but has gotten me rejected my whole life. You're going to feel like you're going to die doing it alone in your apartment with no one there to see you. Why? Because your nervous system is programmed that doing that gets me rejected, which means I'm going to die. So don't ever do that. This is what we're actually up against when we're talking about our coping, numbing, self-sabotage, and scapegoating behaviors. These are the things that have been programmed into your nervous system as being what you need to be in order to be accepted so that you survive, or what you need to not be in order to be accepted so that you survive. They are all based on the fundamental program that was true in your childhood, that acceptance equals love equals provision, Rejection equals not provision equals death. That was the initial program we're all still running. Unless you feel, like genuinely feel, like the whole world could reject you and you'd be fine, you're still running this program. And then based on whatever your caregivers, your society, all of the the, the religious, the educational, the governmental, the institutional influences were over you in your development, so in your early development, but also in your teenage years and your early adulthood, were telling you was this is what you need to be in order to be accepted by us? Because again, you didn't actually evolve into adulthood. Almost none of us did. We didn't get the tools of, okay, now you're an adult. In adulthood, you can perceive your own needs, perceive your own pain and pleasure, and work with reality in order to determine why something hurts, why something feels good, 
in order to learn what your needs are, in order to learn what it is that you're needing so that you can continue to grow and evolve. That's what adulthood is. So when you face a problem, when you face a challenge, when you face pain, when you face trying something and it not going how you thought it was going to go, when you face knowing that there's some part of you that you want to express but you don't know how to do it, when you face these immature parts of self that act in immature ways and make messes and all this, if we were truly trained on how to be an adult, we would all say, okay, what's going on here? Why didn't it go the way that I thought it was going to go? What actually happened? What was I expecting to happen and what actually happened? Why am I in pain? What's the need that's not being met? What's the antagonism? How am I doing something that's going against my true self, real reality? When I, all of these things, right? When I'm in pain, it's not that I'm good or bad. It's just a message. When I'm struggling, I'll be able to figure it out. Because I know how to do that. I know how to look at the things that aren't working, causing pain, the things that are working, pleasure, getting information from those two things, taking another step, understanding a little bit more, taking in more pain, more pleasure, understanding more, keeping going, staying open. That's what adulthood is. What are my needs? How do I meet my needs? How do I get my needs met in the most harmonious way possible? Right? And that's maturation is that we continue to understand what our needs are and then through that process of learning how to meet our needs we mature by learning how to meet those needs in ways that continue to work in harmony with our community and the world that we live in so that our getting our needs met doesn't hinder other people from getting their needs met and or can actually support others in getting their needs met like we we start we expand that's what adulthood is but what most of us did, got stuck in was, no, I'm in pain, I have needs, I don't understand myself, I don't understand pain, all I know is that pain means I'm doing something wrong and bad, and all I know is that being accepted and being approved of is the answer to everything, and being rejected is death. So we've all been building our lives, building our ways of being, building everything that we think is us, everything we think we need to do, everything we think we need to be, everything we think is right, everything we think is wrong, on that fundamental program that survival equals being approved of. The middleman. Getting what I need comes from someone outside of me, understanding me and meeting my need. So being what I need to be so that the people around me will approve of me is how I survive. That's the fundamental program we're all still running in our nervous systems. Not cognitively. In our nervous systems. We learn that in our nervous systems. So now we're people pleasers and we don't understand why we can't put up a boundary. Well, because in your childhood, you couldn't put up a boundary. You had to be a people pleaser. That was how you survived. And then that got programmed into your nervous system. You see, that when you weren't being a people pleaser, you were getting rejected. Your body thought you were going to die. You learned how to people please. You got that love and approval back. That got programmed into your body as being the life saving mechanism. You were loud and obnoxious. That got you rejected. So you learned to shut that part of yourself down. Now, anytime the loud and obnoxious part of you comes out, even if the people around you like it, you feel like you're going to die and you need to shut that part of yourself down. And you do whatever you need to do to numb yourself out. And you don't know why. Because it got programmed into your nervous system that to be obnoxious equals to be rejected, to be rejected equals death. And that program hasn't been questioned. It's been built on and built on and built on. Because now you've been around more and more people who reject you for being obnoxious, who don't like that about you, 
because that's familiar to your nervous system. You don't hang out with people who think that obnoxious people are great. That wouldn't make any sense to you. You wouldn't know how to interact with those people. You know how to shut yourself down, to be calm and quiet, and then the people approve of you, and then you get your needs met. It would feel completely foreign and uncomfortable to be around people who let you be your obnoxious self. Obnoxious, of course, being not a good word. Um, lively, energetic, loud, theatrical. You wouldn't want to hang out with those people because you wouldn't know how to interact with them. You wouldn't know how to win their approval because to your nervous system, being loud and theatrical is bad. So you can't be that. You would never be able to Im impress those people and get them to like you. They would accept the real, actual you. But it's so programmed into your nervous system that to be the real you is to be rejected. To be rejected is to die. So to be good is to be quiet. That you would never want to hang around the people who want you to be loud. Because you would be screaming inside, I'm going to die if I'm loud. So you see, but this is who you really are. So now you have to get drunk in order to be loud. It's the only way you ever let your real self out. Because it lowers your inhibitions, it lowers that nervous system trigger. So you get to be your real self. And then you feel ashamed of it the next day and then you tell yourself you're never going to do that again and you go back to being quiet and being around all the people who approve of you of being quiet. And then eventually you have to drink again to let your real self out in a way that doesn't completely overstimulate your nervous system because alcohol is numbing you. You see the, the pattern that's going on here? So again, we need to understand that these patterns of what we are, how we perceive ourselves, how we perceive the world, what we think we're supposed to be doing, what gets us accepted and loved and approved of. And again, remember now, you've built your entire life on that. What you think your career should be, what, where you think you should live, what you think is the right and wrong way to eat, the relationships that you're in, all of these things got built on these foundational, these are the programs I was taught about what is right and wrong way to be. And maybe you might be the type of person who thinks that you've rebelled from that. And right, you're not like your family at all. You rejected your whole family, whatever. You just went the other way. You might not be any closer to truth than the person who's just living their conditioning. Because to just rebel and to just do the opposite, to just, to just try to prove your caregivers wrong, isn't finding who you really are isn't truly figuring out what reality is. That's just being contra contrary. And it might feel good, and we all have to go through rebellious phases at times, I think. But the real reality is, when we're actually figuring it out, we're no longer really looking at, is this like or unlike what I was taught? Is this like or unlike what other people are doing? We're not looking like that anymore. We're starting to look at what are the actual results I get when I do this? When I eat this diet, does it actually make me feel better or worse? It doesn't matter what people think. It doesn't even matter what it makes me look like. How does it make me feel? What are the results I get? Okay? so. When I work this job, am I actually passionate about it? Am I actually good at it? Or am I just riding the hit of consensus reality pleasure that I'm getting accepted for being who my parents wanted me to be? And then I have to go home and Netflix every night because I literally can't stand this job. Or is it, right, it's not even that the job is wrong. But the way that I go about working my job, I'm like super codependent with all my coworkers and I overextend myself and I don't know how to just be normal in this place. There's deep, deep, deep layers. So 
again, coming to even be able to see why we're doing what we're doing means we have to start to look at these conditioned programs of this is what is acceptable and this is what isn't acceptable that got programmed into your nervous system before you had the capacity to logically think that you have been building your perception of the world on since your childhood it means questioning the water you're swimming in when you don't even know that you're swimming in water this is no small thing this is met right this is meta <laughs> this is mindfulness this is like becoming aware of your own filters of reality that got built in before you had cognition that's the first thing so why am i not seeing it because it's incredibly impossible to see to see our own conditioning is the hardest thing we'll ever do because it was again it's how it's how we were trained to see the world it's not what we were trained to see it's how we were trained to see like just think about that for a second you starting to understand why you do what you do means questioning how you were trained to perceive yourself in the world not what you were taught to see how that's a completely far more complicated thing. So that's the first thing. Why are you not seeing it? Because questioning how you see the world, which is what this work is, is incredibly difficult. Why do I melt down when my people around me are fighting? Right? We might be in a situation where, like I'll speak from personal experience, I would be in a place where I'm standing at the counter like this before I wrote my perception diet. This was, this was the amount of awareness I had. I'm standing at the counter and I'm picking at food. Literally, like I'm totally numbed out and I'm just picking the raisins out of the granola for like an hour. And then I like come out of it and I'm like, oh my God, like what the frick happened? Like that's when I came online at picking at the granola. And I'm thinking, what's wrong with me that I keep doing this? Like I have this really weird, like food bingey behavior. That's where I started. That was my level of awareness. What, what, what am I doing? So I started to ask myself, like, what do I need? What's going on? What's happening? And for a long time, it was just the closest I could get was like, well, I'm exhausted. This is. The only way I know how to like give myself a mental emotional break because for the, all the rest of the time, for the rest of my life, I'm like so overstimulated. Everything is so loud. Everything is so energetically everything. I'm so overwhelmed. Life is hard. Life is scary. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. My body's in pain. Like I'm starting to notice that I'm like really overwhelmed a lot of the time and I don't know how to give myself a rest. So I pick at food because that's it's like a weird thing that helps calm me down. Okay, so maybe I can start to give myself breaks in other ways. So I started to do that, but I still needed to pick at food. And I'm thinking like, well, I'm giving myself a break. I'm letting myself rest. Why am I still doing this? Okay. So then I start to discover, oh, well, yeah living in the Western world and trying to work this hustle life and everything that is required in order to be successful in this way and trying to have the relationships that I'm trying to have and like, okay, this is years and years of introspection, right? But trying to be this person where I'm trying to become an extroverted, outgoing, fun, always there for everyone else, um, never having a need of my own, completely empathic, completely kind, all of these rules that I had for myself and I got to make this amount of money so I can support myself and I have to do it in this way and I have to have this job and I have to have over years and years and years of confronting all of these ideas 
of who I thought I had to be. What was a failure in me, right? So it was a failure that I was overwhelmed all the time. I was supposed to be able to handle it. I should have been able to handle a normal job. I should have been able to be an extrovert who can go and party. As I started to actually be like, okay, these, these are my conditioned things. And like, right in my mind, there was no question that of course I had to be that way. Of course, being an introvert is bad. Being not there for other people is selfish. You have to hustle. You have to make it in the world. These are the only ways to live. This is the only way to do it. And then starting to slowly be like, okay, well, what if that's not true? What if there are other ways of being? What if it's okay for me to be the way that I am, even though it gets me rejected sometimes? Learning to be on my own side. Learning to say, okay, maybe this is the way that I am and I'm just going to have to figure it out. Like slowly, slowly, slowly over time. And I want you to understand that all of that was incredibly triggering on my nervous system the entire time. Scared the shit out of me the entire time. Like the first time I was like, maybe I just am not capable of handling having all these friends. Like trying to have all these friends and be there for all these people. I need space and time. Giving that to myself was the hardest thing I ever did. Because there were so many nervous system programs that told me stories about what was going to happen to me if I did that, that seemed completely reasonable and true to me. That I was so scared all the time to give myself the thing I actually needed. That over and over and over and over and over again, I had to prove to myself that putting up the boundary, not being what people wanted me to be, not being codependent, didn't equal my death. Didn't equal me getting rejected and the whole world falling apart. Like I literally had to show myself, okay, I'm going to deliberately let this person down. I'm going to totally freak out about it. And I'm going to have to show myself, like I'm literally going to have to like sit myself down and look at the world and be like, okay, but you still have a roof over your head. You still have food. You got rejected and you feel like you're going to die, but you're not going to die. You didn't. And slowly over years and years and years of doing that, new behavior, showing myself that I don't die, working through the nervous system trigger, watching as my whole body flip, flips out, changing how I see the world. Now I don't need to pick at food anymore because I have a new way of being. I'm not so overwhelmed in my life because I completely changed my life. Little, little, little step at a time and have reprogrammed my nervous system by every time I made those changes, I let myself freak out and flip out and watch my nervous system totally think I was going to die. And then I had to prove to myself that I didn't over and over and over again because the stories were so loud. It seemed so reasonable to me that if I let this person down in my business, they're going to leave one bad review and then everyone's going to stop listening to me and then I don't have a way of supporting myself and then I'm going to die. Like that felt real to me. But of course that's not reasonable. But I had to show myself, okay, you have to then let this person down and have your body completely melt down and all of the stories and everything is going to happen and then show myself that didn't actually happen. And then do it again and again and again and again and again and eventually my body trusts now that the reality of my childhood is different than the reality I'm living now. So we need our coping mechanisms and our self-sabotage and our numbing and our scapegoating because reprogramming your nervous system that truly believes all of these things is hard and slow, very slow. Just because you tell yourself you're going to be okay, your nervous system doesn't believe you. Your body doesn't care what your intellect is telling you. It needs to be shown over and over and over again. And remember again, 
that the nervous system is programmed in this way, that whatever you did in your childhood to get you love and approval got programmed in as the thing that saves your life. So now every time you feel rejected, every time you feel like someone's abandoning you, every time you feel like you're being misunderstood, your body wants to do that because it thinks you're going to die and it's trying to save your life. And when you're in a fear state, the absolute last thing your body and your nervous system wants you to do is something new because it doesn't know that that's going to work. So you might be doing your new behavior and your body is still going to want to do the old thing because the body doesn't trust that the new thing is actually going to save you yet. So why are you doing new things and still needing to do the old thing? Because it's still wired into your body that the old thing is what saved your life. The old thing is what saved your life. It doesn't trust that the new thing is going to save your life. You have to keep doing the new thing and then orienting and showing yourself you didn't die. And then still do the old thing. And then slowly, slowly, slowly weaning yourself off the old thing. And your nervous system freaks out. And you do it anyways. And then you show yourself you don't die. And then you do the new thing and your nervous system freaks out and then you do the old thing again. It's going to be this over and over and over again. Um, and then same thing with the if you're not feeling like you're resourced, like you're safe with yourself, like your inner self feels safe with you and you're getting your answers and all that stuff, again, it's because you were trained that you aren't your you aren't your source. You were trained from the very beginning that the source is the outside. So if there isn't the outside, you're gonna die. And that program takes forever to resolve, to rejigger. And I'm gonna make another video about that in two videos. Okay, but if you're wondering why you keep doing your thing, because that's what your body thinks saves your life. If I'm going to put it in the shortest terms, it's when you get rejected, when you get abandoned, when anything happens, you might not come online until you're in the coping, numbing, self-sabotaging behavior, but you were triggered way back into doing your behavior by something that happened that made you perceive that you were going to be rejected or abandoned or misunderstood or have a problem that you couldn't fix on your own, which triggered all of these nervous system programs and you're doing your behavior before you even recognize that you're in a fear state. And then your body doesn't want to do anything different because your body really truly believes that this way of being that you've been building for your whole life is the life-saving mechanism. Okay, so I also realize there's a high that comes from feeling less than someone and not letting them down, like faking who I am around them feels so good because you connect on their level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I notice that I'm talking to certain people where I'm used to being small to them and it's no longer a high in the combo because I'm not scared of them and they're not above me anymore and I'm shocked that I didn't die and that feels weird. Yes, absolutely, right? Like it's just whatever our programming was of this is who and what you have to be in order to be accepted. That's what's going to feel good to us in our conditioned state. And then because we are still biological human beings, it doesn't matter how much the condition state feels good. If it goes against what's actually good for us, we are going to need to uh, cope, numb, self-sabotage, self scapegoat to make up for the true pain that comes with doing what consensus reality wanted us to do but is against real reality. And then it's the same when we're doing our processing work. We're going to have consensus reality pain when we do things that actually give true pleasure in the long run because our nervous systems are still wired for consensus reality pleasure and consensus reality pain. Meaning we're going to do what's actually genuine to us and we're gonna freak out. It's gonna feel bad. Because to our nervous system, that's gonna get us rejected and rejection equals death. Getting the new program that I'm an adult now who can figure out my own needs, who can solve my own problems, who can work with real reality, pain and pleasure, it doesn't mean I'm good or bad, it's just a messenger. Getting to that new program takes a long
time. It takes a long time. It takes showing up for yourself and not feeling it for like a year. And then maybe you feel like, oh, maybe my own love means something. And then questioning your shame and your guilt stories over and over and over again. Like if you're in my mystery school, again, the first two thirds of the curriculum, the second curriculum is questioning our shame and our guilt stories. Because yes, is it worth it? Oh my goodness, is it worth it? Is it worth it? There is nothing more worth it. If you're asking my opinion. Because when you get to the other side, which again is like, it's a spectrum. You just, you get there over time, over time, more and more and more clarity. You're free, like actually free to figure out your own life. When challenges come up, you don't shut down. When, when you don't know what to do, you believe in yourself. You figure stuff out. You can make a life that works for you. You can be literally autistic with the, the MTHRFR gene mutation and like all of these things that should make, like I should be dead. I should be in a hospital bed somewhere. I should have no relationships because I was so codependent and so like my perception of everything was so messed up. Like I should be dead or miserable or drugged beyond belief. And instead I have a great life. And it was really hard. And I have a lot of privilege and I admit that. Okay, I had resources that other people don't have. And, right? I'm not saying that everyone can get to where I am or that I did it all by myself. Society helped me. It's always a balance. But ultimately, Doing this work, I have a life that I should not have. I should be dead. And instead I have joy. Like actual joy and enjoyment. Like, I shouldn't have that. Not based on where I come from. Like how sick I was mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, like just, no. So if you're asking me if it's worth it, well, yes, this is why I've dedicated my life to getting this work out there. Because I believe that if it can literally give me a life that I want to live, I believe it's possible for everybody. Because it was really bad for me. <laughs> okay, so this is why. Because it's not an intellectual understanding. It's a nervous system program that we repeatedly challenge and orient and get our nervous systems to see something new and do something new and see something new and do then do the old thing and question how we see reality. Question how we perceive we are going to get our needs met. Question what do I really need to be accepted? What would actually happen if I got rejected? And then being rejected and telling ourselves that we're here for ourselves and feeling like that doesn't mean anything. Feeling lost and scared and confused and showing up for ourselves and feeling like there's no one there and it doesn't matter. And we're just more abandoned and more alone. That's going to be a part of it. Like I said, I'm going to make a whole nother video about the like not believing yourself when you're trying to be there for yourself and trying to be there for yourself actually feeling worse sometimes. That's normal. And we're going to work through that. But ultimately, that's what this is. It's reprogramming your nervous system that was programmed from the very beginning of your life is not going to happen in a couple of sessions or a couple of weeks or a couple of times doing something different. Your body needs to learn that these new ways work better than the old ways, which means a lot of repetition and a lot of questioning your stories because even when you do the new thing, if you still are believing all the old stories, your body's still going to think you're about to die. So it's about like bringing yourself into real reality and like, okay, well, is this actually true? Is this actually true right now? And that is really hard work. Like following your fear all the way through and actually questioning what am I actually thinking is going to happen right now? Because it's going to seem so logical and reasonable to you, again, that the thing that you're doing is bad and wrong and you can't do it. 
And then when you really question the story, you're going to be like, oh, there was actually like so much in there. Like, again, if I let these two people that I love continue to fight, I'm going to be in my coping mechanism. Why? Well, because they can't keep fighting. Why? Because if they keep fighting, okay, but why? Right? And then you start to realize, well, it's because in my childhood, my caregivers, if they kept fighting, they weren't paying attention to me. I couldn't get my needs met. So me being a mediator got my needs met. So now anytime I'm around people who are fighting, I feel like I'm going to die. Because people around me fighting equals me not getting my needs met. And me not mediating equals me not getting my needs met. So now I don't feel like I can be okay if people are fighting around me. And then I end up coping in some way. And it's going to seem totally logical to you that you can't let these people fight. Right? And then you're going to have to let them over and over and over again and see that you don't die even though you didn't intervene. That you're an adult now and people around you can be fighting and you don't die. But that's what you learned in your childhood, right? So your body is going to be fighting with that for the hundred times that you do it. And then the hundred and first time, it will be like, okay, we didn't die. We don't need to binge. Like, that's what it's going to be. You get it? Okay? That's why this takes so long. So you're not doing it wrong. It's questioning how you see and then reprogramming your nervous system by doing the things that your body are literally programmed not to do over and over and over again as you show yourself that you don't die over and over and over again until eventually your body learns that the new way is safe. That's why you're still doing it. Okay? So let yourself go slow. Let yourself understand this is going to be a slow process. This isn't an intellectual thing. You're not broken. These are patterns that have been wired into your body from the very beginning that you've been building on your whole life. How you see the world. It's a lot. It's complicated. So you got to be in it for the long haul. There's no 30-day quick fix for this. You just got to keep showing up, keep questioning, keep doing the new thing, all of that. Um, someone asked if I do one-on-one -on -one coaching. Not really. I'm <laughs> like, right, send me an email uh, and we can talk about it. But most people find that getting into the mystery school is actually what they need. Um, like, I've put all of it in there. But, yeah, <laughs> just putting that out there. Um, so that's that. Okay? It's hard. It's a lot. And sometimes we do need therapy. Sometimes we do need someone who can see our patterns where we can't see them. That, there's nothing wrong with that. We just, we do what we do. We use the tools that are available. If we can, we do. If we can't, we do what we can. That's why I put as much out there for free as that I, I can. Because it's just hard. It's just complicated. It's just a lot. There's no quick fix. But it's fully worth it. Okay? So I hope that helps. Keep on your path. You're not doing anything wrong. You're making progress. You're doing it right. I see you, You're, you are worth it, your life is worth it, okay? There's nothing wrong with you. You're going to cope numb and self-sabotage for as long as you need to. And just make, make, make it more and more okay, make it more and more safe. You're actually going to learn faster from it the more you make it like a, this is just innocent. This is how I'm doing this. I'm doing this for a good reason. There's absolutely nothing wrong with me. The safer you make yourself in what you're doing, the more you're going to discover, the faster you're going to get through it. So I'm, if you want to know how to make it go the fastest you can make it go, keep being nice to yourself. Making yourself a safe place. Making it okay. Not blaming and shaming and believing you're broken because you aren't. Just being like, okay, work. this is my programming. I'm going to continue to investigate it until I understand it enough that I can do something different, that I can show my nervous system something different over and over and over again, and eventually I won't need this anymore. And when I get there, I'll know because I just won't need it anymore. And until then, I have compassion for myself. Okay? okay. I love you. You're amazing. And I'll see you in the next video.